Welcome back, everybody, to the Uncensored CMO. Now, it won't have passed you by that one of the biggest challenges we face in our generation is the climate crisis. And one of the companies really doing something about it is Octopus Energy. Energy contributes so much to the challenges in the environment today. And they are doing astonishing things with renewable energy. And as a business, have absolutely transformed themselves from a startup to a really significant challenger, turning over over 10 billion pounds. Now, I'm joined in this episode by Rebecca Dib Simkin, who is the Chief Product and Marketing Officer of Octopus, to find out about the journey from startup to major challenger and disruptor in the industry. What can we do to save the planet and change how we are using energy? And what are the marketing secrets of a company that have enjoyed such good success over the last few years? And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this on audio right here, right now, don't forget that I also have a YouTube channel where you can not only listen, you can see the guests in glorious Technicolor, see their reactions to my questions and enjoy the full 3D experience. So do check it out over at Uncensored CMO over on YouTube. Rebecca, welcome to the show. Hello, nice to be here. Why don't we go back to the beginning? Because I think you and I share a few uh, a few things in common, don't we? Apparently, yes. Apparently so. We're going to discover this. But um, we both made a move from accountancy into marketing, didn't we? So tell me about your kind of move into marketing and how it came about. Well, I was I always thought I was going to be an accountant. So I did business at university at Nottingham. Uh, I was quite good. I'm top of my year in financial accounting. I won the financial accountancy prize. Um, had a job to, to go to with one of the big four. Um, quite quite happy, and uh, and then I saw a brilliant long copy ad on the back of the student uni magazine for the Ogilvy graduate scheme, written by the brilliant Rory Sutherland. He does know this story. I've told it enough enough of that he doesn't think I'm weird anymore. And was so inspired about how somebody could do such amazing things with words. Um, that I applied and, and ended up getting a job in in advertising. Moved to moved to London, um, and then from then into into marketing was kind of the natural natural progression. That's brilliant. But, yeah, it's funny because I, th- I think I think you and I may have run parallel. You see, because I, I did a finance degree and uh, ended up working for Coopers and Lybrand, so all very grown up. And I was in the um, I was actually in the tax department. I mean, it doesn't get more nice. sensible. I know. And uh, I was in the personal tax department, so I had all these like you know, wealthy executives that flew around the world. And uh, I had to work out how much tax I had to pay. And there was this one guy. And uh, I remember he worked for a company called Dun & Bradstreet, which I, th- I think was a, like a data company or something yeah. at the time. And um, I worked out, I was doing a tax return, and I worked out that if he spent two more days out of the country, I could save him £10,000. But he refused to return my calls and it's getting nearer and nearer and nearer to the deadline. I'm going, I've got to get him into the into a meeting to tell him that he needs to leave the country for a couple of days and I'll save him money. Eventually I got him into the office and we sat down. I said, I've got some great news for you. I can save you ten thousand pounds. He goes, Oh, how? I said, just get out of the country next weekend. <laughs> thing. Anyway. Um and then as I was chatting to him, I said, so what do you do for a job then? And he was the marketing director for this data co- global data company. And I'm like, damn, your job sounds a lot more interesting than mine. So I thought I'd rather kind of make the money than count the money sort of thing. And that was like the moment that I thought, yeah, I'm going to get into marketing. The problem I had was, and this is what you reminded me about the Ogilvy thing, is I was just finishing my degree at Brunel and I'd done finance and economics. And I'd done a couple of placements, one at a bank, one at an accountancy firm. And then I thought, I'm going to apply for the, the marketing schemes at companies. And I thought, I know what, I love cars, right? So this is my plan. I'm going to go, I'm going to be a marketing director in a car company. And I'm going to pick my favorite brand was Mercedes. So the only thing I applied for my final year was the Mercedes graduate scheme. And I I actually, um, I took their ad at the time for the new E-class, right? And I, re- I rewrote the copy to describe me. Wow. Literally rewrote nice. it. So that, nice. those are about, you know, performance and beauty and all this kind of thing. Didn't hear back. Oh. I got the stand. Well, I, I did. I got the standard letter yeah. that said my application was received and would be on file. Right, but it shows how life is funny because twenty years later, and I'm going to sound old now. I was lecturing at Ashridge Business School to the Mercedes Benz Senior Directors Program globally, and we did this thing where we go around the room and everyone introduced themselves. I was doing a talk on um, challenger brands and being innovative in big companies. Anyway, I met the HR director from that time. 
<laughs> so I was like, can I have a word? <laughs> did he say, I remember you? I no, remember he denied one. all knowledge. Yeah. He said, oh, we get thousands of applications a year. It's I'm sorry. Really, and all sort do of you know, thing. it's really funny. Two years ago, I actually hired someone. So I was, I was recruiting for a senior role. And the first CV I read was someone who was obviously incredibly keen, didn't quite think she was right, said, said no, I had hundreds of applications. And she then linked in me and she sent me a poem written about why she should work at Octopus. It was so fucking brilliant. I hired her. She's now doing the role that I was recruiting for two years ago because the other person didn't work out. Amazing. Yeah. It just goes shows a bit of creativity yep. can yep. go a long but way. It doesn't you stand always, because people do try it in marketing. And I do get, I mean, you need creativity and brilliance underneath it. You know, it was nice that she did a poem. It was also a fucking good poem. You know, she was clearly super bright. It was just completely spot on what we do. You know, it was just all of those things. But yeah. I love stories yeah. like that. So maybe That's... your copy wasn't very good. Well, to be fair, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my strong point. We'll come back to uh, marketing skills in, in, in a minute. But um, tell me tell me things you don't like about marketing. We were having quite a conversation earlier about things that we don't like in marketing. What, what, what annoys you? I mean, any kind of marketing jargon at all really I, I spent years trying to understand you know what a, I don't know what a brand hierarchy was and what, a, what I remember uh, what a message track was and how segmentation and personas work and I just you know it's, it's almost like a kind of language that you have to learn and if you if you don't learn it you don't know how to sell stuff to humans but I actually seem to do that quite effectively so I just you know I, it's actually a bit of a joke at work now that you can't I don't even like the word proposition at work, right. new people coming in, they go, let's talk about the value proposition. I'm like, what the fuck does value proposition mean? And I just, I still don't understand it. It's um, like that moment you explain what you do to friends and yeah. then you realise you go, well, our proposition is this. And you're going, who talks like but, that? You know? But people don't do it. You say, what do you do? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know I've, I've grown an energy company from nothing to one of the most well-known in, in the UK. And we were about green energy and fairness and brilliant customer service. And we've got a pink octopus and, you know, people really like us. You know, nowhere there was there a value proposition. You know, it's just... I love yeah, that. I love yeah. that. The, the one that used to really annoy me early in my career was people used to talk about being classically trained marketers. And it, it was like, I remember I, I, my first ever marketing job that I didn't get was on Pepsi Max. I, I was gutted. I, it was my dream job came up at Britney where I was at the time. And um, I got the feedback. I wasn't, well, I got two bits of feedback. One, I wasn't classically trained. I hadn't obviously done the right things and talked the right way. And I wasn't creative enough, which I, I, I I really got very upset by that because, you know, because um, I was, I was being judged based on my past, not based on my potential. And that used to that used to really annoy me. But, yeah, the phrase classically trained is is I don't even know what that means. Like, yeah, there is there a co secret course that some people have done that everyone else hasn't done. No, I mean, I you know, in my market, I mean, you have to know how to do certain it's helpful to have people who can know how to do certain things like get a direct mail campaign out and how to get a TV ad signed off and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of, you know, the insight that sits behind it, people who are brilliant, I look for people who are brilliant and understand human behaviour and what drives humans to do things and react in a particular way. And I think you have to be a student of the brain and a student of, of humans and psychologists work really well in this kind of role. It's actually understanding that. And it's, yeah, it's, I don't think you can my my, my my theory on this is the closer you are to your actual customer, the less you need the theory. Because it's uh, when, when I've met people that have been really, really into here's my persona, meet Jane, she does yoga sort of thing, you know, that kind of thing. It's because they don't know their customers, right? If you were spending every day on the phone to your customers or you were out there in the shops, you know, when they're buying, you just know because you're like, you see how they behave, you see how the decisions they make, you talk to them, you experience it yourself. Um, is that something for you at Octopus Energy? Are you, how close are you to your customer is that something that's very important? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, you just have to be there with them. So, for example, when we send a new email campaign, we're doing one this morning, actually, which I'm keeping an eye of, you know, something new. And we will send, say, 2,000 emails initially. And all the responses come back into the marketing inbox. And all of the team will be stood around the table, including me, going, what are customers saying? Right? And they go, oh, OK, well, that's interesting. They've asked that question. Clearly, that wasn't clear enough. Let's tweet the copy. Let's send another 2,000. And we will do that over and over again until we know we can start sending 100,000, 200,000, because we've optimized that copy because we've understood exactly that's not clear and that's not clear. And actually, we can direct people that way. Um, and that's, and that's um, you know, and I'd never get that from a focus group. I've never no. done a focus group at Octopus. So if I want to test something, I talk to customers. We all have access to the same system. We, you know, we have a system called Kraken at Octopus, which is our um, full end-to-end -end tech stack. And actually, everyone gets it. So if I want to go and you send something to a customer, I can go and find customer details and talk to them. I can go into the emails and I read every day the emails that customers send us. Like you just, you're just there with it. Mm, and and that, so that's how you kind of, I mean, I was saying earlier, I think you have to be aware a little bit of, um, 
you know, if, if your own bias is coming to, to, to something, so, you know, that actually I think about the world in a particular way because, you know, of, of where I'm from, where I've brought up, where I live and all that kind of thing. So sometimes you have to particularly be, you know, look, look into other groups that you might not be so aware of. But I think generally just being really, really close to the humans who, you know, who kindly pay your salary is the only way to do it. But without doubt, my best work has always been done when I'm closest to my customer and yeah. often in crisis situations, actually, where you have to get close and understand how it goes on. Um, it seems to me I, I, I probably lay claim to being the shortest lived CMO in history because I worked at BrewDog for three months and got fired. But I did learn quite a lot while I was there. And one of the things that impressed me, I mean, again, James, who runs BrewDog, has never done a focus group, yeah. um, but he spends a lot of time in the bars, obviously. So he, he, there's that. But what he also has is he have this he has this group of 2000 equity for punks they call them people who have invested in 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 the business and they're really really big fans of the brand and they've got an opinion and i noticed what he used to do was if he couldn't decide on a pack design or a, a, the name of a beer he just literally just go option a option b send it to this group of 2000 they were so keen they would literally give loads of feedback straight away and he almost ran the entire business like that with this effectively well i suppose it's a 2000 people focus group but it's just instant response yeah. and yeah. You know, it's very impressive. Yeah, and I mean, I often think of myself as a little bit of a, a, a spider on a web, you know, and a fly hits a web and they kind of know where it know where it is. And it's like there's lots and lots of inputs which tells me how customers are feeling, you know. So it's like, you know, we use um, Slack at work to communicate. So we've got 3,000 people all talking through Slack. So I'm in different Slack channels with different, you know, operations teams, our customer service teams. So I can kind of spot, oh, there's a lot of chat going on around that particular thing. And then I might look at Twitter and go, oh, there's a lot of chat around that particular thing. And then I'm like, let's send something out and see what responses we get. So you're kind of, you're using all your senses all the time in the middle of the web to kind of work out what's going on and what you can what you can improve. And you can piece all those things together to help you yes. be better informed yes. decisions. decision. Yes, yeah. so, you know, social media is quite good early warning system something goes there we particular kinds of people use social media and use twitter um so a lot of our smart tariff you know early adopting customers will go there first of all but it's a good you know and i'm like okay that's interesting that's come up on twitter we wouldn't usually come up on twitter that may mean there's a problem elsewhere because if it's a problem it's it's bubbled up to a channel it wouldn't usually come out of so it's, it's that kind of technique now i want to go back to when you started at octopus right so yeah. you if i get this right you were at british gas for a number of years before yes. that yeah, so tell me the moment you decided to leave british gas and take the jump to a, a what was then a pretty small startup yeah it was it was because i because i as I said i started off you know in in advertising then ended up british gas was a client and i quite like british gas actually because i was like oh god i want to go watch it, british gas from advertising they've got a bar in the office and now i have to go to british gas where they all are quite smart and everything but i liked it because they moved me around every couple of years and they they're doing they were doing cool stuff um and then i at the, at the end of my time now i worked in their hive business which was their internet of things business building new tech so i was building thermostats so that was really cool but it got quite big uh, and when I joined Hive, it was again, it was kind of startup within a within a bigger business, 30 people. And then over a few years, it got quite successful, got to 200 people, you know, lots of HR people started joining and strategy people. And I was like, I just feel like I quite like to build something again. So I was, you know, casting my CV out and my CV got passed to Greg Jackson, who's the, the founder and, and CEO of Octopus Energy. Actually, it was funny, the reason it got passed to him was I was actually trying to apply for a job um, at Mumsnet that a friend of his worked at and he was supposed to pass it on and then he forgot so about three months later I got this email from him saying I'm totally sorry I think I was supposed to do you a favour and pass your CV on but actually I've had a look at it and it's actually really good and do you fancy coming and having a chat and he said um, I'm, I've got time today or next Tuesday now I'm a very like now or never person I'm incredibly impatient and I literally looked down sit at my desk looked down thought oh, I'm quite smart today it was like 10 o'clock mm -hmm. right I'll go and do an interview now and by the end of the day had a had had a job what an amazing story that's brilliant <laughs> he, he's brilliant. a similar type so we were like yeah oh, you hit it off it. straight away yeah, did you? yeah yeah uh, slight, a slight detail actually you just reminds me internet of things i think the most random meeting i've ever done in my life was um i, I was asked to um i was asked to a, a speak to speak at a dinner a sort of a private dinner on marketing and the organization sent me the wrong date uh, so it, it was about a month early to when i was supposed to do it so i turned up at this dinner and I sat down and they introduced me as the speaker, but the topic was the Internet of Things. Nice. And I, I'm the least technical person possible. And I, I didn't know whether to kind of admit that I was in the wrong place, but I actually went through with it. And they sat down and said, John, we're really looking forward to hearing your talk on the Internet of Things. Which is because no one knows what it is anyway. It's, but you know what? You know. It was the funniest thing because they, they said it was the best talk ever. And the reason it's best talk ever is I what I basically did is said, 
don't think about what the technology can do. Think about the problem it can solve for people, real people in real situations who are real consumers. So I'm going to throw the question back on you, right? Stop thinking about it from a technological what you can, you know, sort of thing. And they're like, oh, yes, good point. Never thought about that. You know, yeah. Basic marketing question. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And we had no, this big brainstorm about, you know, how we could, do, how we could, do, I said, that was so useful. <laughs> and I, well, I, I said, never, never kind of like, wow. had to think on my feet as much as that. Anyway, sorry, you gave me a flashback to that. No, anyway, get, back to energy, is. back yes. to energy. Yes. Um, look, climate, right? Yeah. So um, talk to me about the mission of Octopus Energy. What is it that inspired you personally to get behind this, you know, this business and do what you're doing? So I, when I first met Greg, said to him that really I was done with energy marketing. Worked, you know, British Gas for a long time, wanted to get, I like tech, actually. I, I like what I do, I wanted to build stuff. And he said, well, I'm going to build a company which is, you know, it won't be like, unlike any other energy company and it'd be tre- tech driven. Um, and I was quite captivated by he, both his vision and the ability that they had to, to deliver on their promises to build this technology. Um, and it, Octopus was set up not just with a green slant, climate slant, but actually to be a fairer business. So so um, Greg had a real passion for, he thought that energy was broken and people were being ripped off and he could build a better kind of company, a fairer company. So the sense of social justice is very strong with him. Um, but also climate change is the biggest challenge of our of our age, right? You know, we need to stop you know, pumping crap out there um, into our atmosphere. It, it's, it's really interesting, actually, one of our, jumping slightly, but one of our big investors is um, is Generation, which was co-founded by Al Gore, the former yeah, vice president. And yeah. if you're in the climate space, yeah. he's a bit of a hero. And I've been lucky enough to, to meet him a couple of times. Uh, he tells the story that he says that the shell of atmosphere around the earth is so small that if you turn a car on end and drive it full tilt up to the ozone layer, it will only take you about five to seven minutes. So that's the shell around the earth that we are pumping full of crap. Mm. That is not very big. It's not a lot, that's is it? Not five minutes you think drive. About it. Five minutes drive is where you hit, there's different layers of yeah. atmosphere above the earth and it's where you hit the layer that keeps everything in, basically. So, you know, I, I, I realised, I joined Octopus because it felt like, not necessarily just because of Green, but it felt like a company that could do things better. Um, and I wanted to join a startup and it was an exciting team. But more and more um, over the years, I discovered that actually you know, unlocking the power of, of renewable energy and moving to a renewable energy system is, you know, what going to be one of the ones fundamental ways that will save us from climate change and that Octopus has the technology to do that. And that actually some things happen that were kind of hidden. So, for example, right now it is cheaper to produce a green electron, i.e. from a wind turbine or a solar farm, than it is to produce a brown electro- electron from, from coal or, or, or oil. It's actually cheaper to produce. But because of all the complexities of how the market is set up and all the taxes that go on, you know, actually that, in, that green electron is actually inflated in price. There's a load of stuff broken around it. But, you know, we have... The other thing that, that, that Al said, I mate Al, um, he said that tech will save us. As, as a species, you know, that we are a bit fucked up and we are breaking a lot of stuff, but we are smart, you know, and curious and brilliant and tech will save us as it did, you know, during the pandemic with a vaccine rollout in six months. And we have the technology to save us from climate change. And sometimes it's just about forcing the message through that it's here. And it's not, you know, green energy isn't more expensive for someone who's vegan and, you know, kind of lives off the land. It's actually cheaper and better and more positive for everyone. So that's what I'm trying to help deliver. I mean, it's insane what you're saying in terms of clean en- green energy actually being cheaper, yeah. right? That I mean, that is, well, it's encouraging, right? Because it means it's like there's a business case for it. Yeah. Um, what, what are the greenest forms of energy? And what is Octopus? You talk about the technology that Octopus has. What is that technology that's enabling green energy to, you know, to basically provide the energy needs of our nation? So, I mean, any we talk about renewable energy, anything um, created from renewable sources, so solar, wind, big over here, um, tidal, there's various other ways of doing it, biogas. The, the, the technology that, w- that we have, we have uh, Kraken, which is our, our own software platform. Basic, one of the challenges with renewables is that they are intermittent. So you might have a really sunny day and you get shitloads of it. And then it's not a sunny day and you don't get you don't get so much. I've got solar panels on my house and I get home in the evening. My husband's like, oh, we've got 20 kilowatts today, you know, darling. 
And whereas, you know, the traditional energy system, when you're using coal fire power stations, like if you needed more, they'd just turn it on and they'd start burning and they'd produce more electricity, right? And the national grid and most grid systems whose job is to balance the energy that we need. So it's very finely balanced. They will work out, it's incredibly complex, how much electricity is needed for people to heat their homes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they'll make sure they've got enough power and they have to keep it within a certain balance. Otherwise, things start going pop, Right. And historically, they've gone, okay, well, we're going to need, it's going to be really busy on Saturday because the football's on. I mean, they literally look at that kind of stuff. So we're going to need another coal-fired power station ready to switch on, right? Now, actually, what we need to do is move to renewables. But because you can't always switch renewables on and off, what Kraken does is kind of unlock optimization. So, for example, can you, um, if it was a really sunny day and you've got lots of power, can you say to people, consumers, would you like to use more to say it's cheaper? Or... If you haven't got very much, which is something we've done recently, you go, do you know what? There's a bit, we're a bit sparser on the grid um, at five o'clock till six o'clock today. Um, we'd rather not turn another coal station on. So actually, could you use a bit less? Um, and it's something with real world trials. So over the last few months, hundreds of thousands of customers have taken part in these kind of sessions. They're called saving sessions, which is where we say to people, use a bit less or use a bit more at these times to help balance the grid. And that's the technology that, that we we enable. So, so theoretically, could, could I then decide when to record this podcast based on when the cheaper time yes. of day would be? Yes, and not I theoretically, could, actually. You can do that now, I actually, right? You can I do can, that right now. Okay, right. We're going to do it at 2.30, not yep. at 11 o'clock in yep. the morning. Yep, so you use power, which is, which power is greener. cheaper. Green and is that also why electric vehicles often decide themselves when to recharge because they can absolutely spot on yes wow yes amazing so it, it is a really clever system but imagine you know and it, i do not even imagine it's, it's getting here right now that you know you plug in your car and we decide when to charge it based on when it's cheaper or greener so we have a tariff called intelligent octopus um, and we say you know we will always guarantee you this very cheap rate but you plug it in you tell us you, you want it at 100 by eight o'clock in the morning you've plugged it in at six you know and we just work it out so it, it's it's here right now and um, and it works for all consumers as well if you don't have an electric car actually you know this kind of balancing brings down costs for everyone because it means you don't have to have like coal stations on on standby which is quite expensive um it moves us towards a world of renewables anyway which said are cheaper it's just it's a win-win for everyone and one of the challenges of course is cost of living isn't it because i I noticed the demand for evs unfortunately is going down isn't it because it's a high ticket item and very expensive out of a lot of people's reach but what you're doing is saving people money at the same time, which presumably in a cost of living crisis is is quite helpful. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Cost of living. I mean, the energy crisis is is very real. So wholesale prices, the wholesale price of, of, of gas, which still generally drives electricity, a lot of electricity is still made from from gas as well as renewables, you know, is still kind of three to five times what it was um, a year ago, massively, massively spiked. There's nothing in the short term that we can do about that from renewables because you know, the system is kind of already there. We're, we're, we're hooked in. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is show people that the technology is there. We need to unlock and unwrap some of the centuries of complexity and regulatory red tape around why it's more expensive and, you know, look at how we might change the grid to enable that kind of flexibility of, of wires to, you know, and give people a bit of hope that actually there's there's change coming right now because, you know, it's yeah, hope is what we need really. So, for example, some of, one of the things we work quite a lot on is that um, it doesn't take very long to build a wind turbine, right? So you build a wind turbine in a year, but it might take five or even 10 years to go through the red tape to actually connect it to the grid so you can get that power from it, right? That seems bonkers, you know? Like if we want to kind of move away from dependence on the oil coming from other countries who may constrain it for their own purposes to send prices up, then, you know, homegrown British power from renewables needs to be unlocked much so quicker. So theoretically then, let's imagine there was no red tape, right? Yeah. So red tape ends tomorrow. How long does it take for the UK to become fully renew- powered by renewables? Oh, gosh. I mean, not long. Uh, you know, I think it would be a, a few years. Yeah. If you could literally just kind of... Because it's cheaper. Some gross stuff. It's cheaper. It can be done in a few years. Yes, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. need the red tape it's removed. The red tape. That's insane, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, you know... the. the, the Wind turbines, turbines are a little bit controversial, right? Because there's a bit of kind of like, I don't really know if I want a wind turbine in my landscape, but there's a lot of research that we've done. We've done research. It's been independent research as well saying, well, if you go, if you had a wind turbine near you, but your power was cheaper when it was spinning, 
you know, would you be happy? And everyone's like, oh yeah, that, that'd be all right. That'd be all right. So we've got two wind turbines where we're trialing this. We call them fan club. There's one in Wales and one in Yorkshire where actually if you live within, I think it's five kilometres, when, when it's spinning, we send you a text message saying your power's half price, put your washing on. That's amazing. Isn't that, isn't that, that. cool, right? That's and it's so just, cool. and that's what we will do more and more because actually you but go... These, but these trade-offs you know, are real. I mean, think about commercial TV. It's like, well, we're going to show you some adverts. And you get the content for free. Yeah. Same kind of model, totally. isn't it? Totally. Peaking off people. People are very happy. You know, right? you, you, get it. you know, you know there's yeah. a trade off and you're yeah. happy to take it. Yeah, totally. So it's like with the the saving sessions program that's recently run with, with National Grid, where National Grid actually trialed for the first time ever not having coal stations on standby when they thought they needed some more power, but actually relying on consumers to use a bit less. So we would message all our consumers and say, Would you if you use less between five and six tonight? Um, then we will pay you for every every bit you use less, right? So if you do you use five kilowatt hours and you use three, we'll pay you for those two. Um, and you don't have to. Like if you have to cook your tea at five, then cook your tea at five. There's power for all. But enough people are like, well, I'm not that bothered, so I won't cook my tea at five. I'll do it at six. Made the difference. Literally off peak and on peak trains. You choose when you travel. Now, sticking on cost of living crisis, because it, it's been a challenge for energy companies. Obviously, there's been a number go out of business, but it's been really hard on the consumer, hasn't it? So what, what are you doing to help those people that can't afford energy? Yeah. Oh, it's incredibly difficult. So we talked about 40,000 customers every day um, at Octopus and just, you know, it, it's so the wholesale rates are, are so high it's so so it's it's so hard for people i mean everything we can i think you know we always try to be you know the best thing you can do if you're worried about your bills is talk to your energy company because there's lots of ways that they can help you know with payment plans or, or you know uh, or support or put signpost you to the right organizations we have a 15 million pound fund called the octopus assist fund where we can credit people's bills and offer people help We've given out 40,000 free electric blankets this year to vulnerable customers. Um, electric blanket is an incredibly effective way of staying warm. Um, so it actually costs about 3p an hour to heat yourself. So it's literally it's one way you sit on the sofa and you kind of have it as a lovely warm throw. Where, you know, as opposed to if you're heating the whole house, it might cost you £2 That's or something. That's a genius idea because you're heating just where the heating's needed, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're not so heating a whole house heat, heat, and you're sat in the lounge watching TV. You just, you just heat you. Just I mean, I've got one. Like, literally, if you haven't got an electric blanket, you are, you are missing out. Um, and actually, we found that we've just done some the customers with our electric blankets spent 20% less on their energy than customers without an electric blanket this this winter so we've given thousands of them out to particularly to those who will benefit the most so if you're slightly mobile if you're elderly you know if there's a reason that you can't move around a lot and keep yourself warm then then, then we give them out but that's been a wonderful thing to do we've diverted over the of a you know of a funds into that um internally so dialing back on we dial back on our advertising um, over over the winter, didn't feel the right thing to spend on. Um, we dialed back on sending out our cuddly octopus to customers. It was all like, actually, how can we put as much money as possible into helping customers as as practically as possible? I'd love to go back to the beginning and just because you know you're in big company now. I think ten billion or something you turn yep. over now. But when you joined. We had 50,000 customers, yep. a team of 30, I think yeah, I might yeah, say. Yeah, they were like 30 like, or so. That's yeah. a massive yeah. transformation. Yeah. Like, tell me what, well, the first question I'd love to know is like, what, are the, what have you done as a business to grow at that kind of rate? I mean, that's an insane amount of growth, isn't it? So w- what as a brand has led to that level of success in a short period of time? Um, gosh, hunger, I think, to make a difference. And keeping that startup mentality that you just want to to grow and grow and grow. And I, I think there's a good, there's a Jeff Bezos quote, which is something about the only competitive advantage you've got is speed, that everyone else will copy you um, at some point, but just, you know, go quicker than ever. And I think the model that we've built within the business, which is, you know, trying to hire empowered smart people and let them get on with it you know we 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 don't let functions creep up who argue with each other we don't let processes creep up that are ineffective it's all about being close to the customer and building stuff that that they want and dealing with customers as we would like to be dealt with and i think a lot of companies say that but then they're you know they're they're tempted by you know, going back to marketing jargon well if I, I don't really want to talk to a customer so i could just have a focus group and then i could hire someone to run the focus group and then i can hire an agency to analyze the output from the focus group and then i could go to the agency's offices to have coffee and posh biscuits and look at the result and all that kind of thing whereas like we will just like email some customers and see what they say back yeah. you know it's harder it's, it's it, that's that's pressure on on the team but if you you know it just makes you that much more effective yeah. and, and easy to scale you, you, you remind me actually going back to brew dog uh, in my three months 
the the fame my most favorite quote from james and, and he said this all the time he, he had this phrase that goes this will only work if and his most common answer to his own question you'd pose a question and answer it, it goes this will only work if we are 10 times quicker than anybody else. Yeah. He exactly bought into the Bezos thing. Like, yeah. you know, how can you do in six weeks what would take six months? Or yeah. in fact, actually, yeah. now I say that, he never gave me six weeks. I think the longest deadline I had was two weeks. But, you know, it was, how do we do this by tomorrow? Yeah. How do we do this by the end of the week? How do we do this 10 times bigger? How do we do this 10 times faster? And just that constant ambition yeah. to kind of challenge yourself to go be yeah. bigger and go faster and, and take the barriers down and find a way through. Yeah. Um, because I think in big corporate organizations, they've almost created infrastructure to keep them at the speed they're at, you know, annual planning cycles and, you know, support departments and yeah. processes and yeah. ways of working. And all these things are designed actually to hold the state of status quo, isn't it, in, in what you're doing? Yeah. But I'm fascinated by, given that you've grown so big, how do you keep that kind of focus on the customer, the hunger that you had at the beginning? How do you make that, sustain that? Because that's not easy. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not. Uh, we, we had, um, so yeah, with 3,000 people now, we had 82,000 job applications last year. 82,000. I mean, it's just, it's just insane, isn't it? And I can't believe it. And I still think in my head of like, you know, that we're like about 100 people in our first little ramshackle offices where there were two dodgy toilets that always got blocked. You know, I'm like, I, I can't quite understand that we're, that we're so big now. I think the, the, the key thing is, I mean, it's still very much so. I was one of the last people into the very senior management team reporting into the CEO and founder that very small core team still run the business. They're still the most senior SMT. It's very tightly run people who just know how it works. And then what's happened underneath is that the people when I joined, there were 10 people who were our NG specialist operations people. They're now pretty much all with the business, but they've grown with the business, right? So one of them's in Japan, you know, running our Japanese business. One of them's in the USA. One of them's just come back from Australia. So actually those people who were graduates or second jobbers are now head, head of operations with hundreds of people working for them. So they've been brought up in our culture. And they're now bringing people underneath them as well. So that's that's what it is. It's actually organically. You know, we don't tend to bring in senior people, really. Um, we tend to, you know, we we grow junior people into into that into that mold. That's very um, very interesting. Yeah. And another thing I think stands out about your organisation is how lean it is from a marketing point of view. Because not only do you do a lot of the marketing product development yourself, but your team is actually quite small relative to the size of the organisation, isn't it? So what's the advantage of having an in-house product you know product team and marketing team yeah so we have about I think it's probably about 20 do do marketing for the whole well, I mean, the, the whole of the uk and actually we support a lot of our countries as well so we do all our design in-house videography in-house media buying in-house everything I think it's just, I mean, it's just speed and getting stuff out there. So if I wanted to do new ad, new ad, I literally turned to the designer who sits next to me and said, could you have a little go? I've been thinking about this concept, you know, can you put something together? And then, you know, 45 minutes later, she'll go, oh, okay, what do you think of this? And I'll feed it back and then you go back again. And again, it's not like, you know, I have to phone the account manager at an agency and then she goes and briefs creators via traffic. Um, and then the creators go to the creative director and they go back to, the, you know, all that kind of thing. And then four weeks later, you sit down with the client and they have coffee and nice biscuits and all that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Now, I love agencies. I agree it was fabulous. And there's fabulous agencies out there. And I do I do often look around at competitors and I'm like, you know, with great campaigns, there's, there's what there's one at the moment. I'm like, gosh, that's that feels agency, but it's bloody good. Yeah. But I think for absolute speed and agility and getting stuff out the door and closeness to customers, having it in-house works incredibly well for us. I mean, help, I'm ex-agency. I have a creative director who's ex-agency as well, but that's that's really what it is. I mean, talking to customers, I, I, I had a little play on the website just to kind of get the experience oh, yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, always, always good, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, one thing that struck me, I love the simplicity of it, right? Because mm -hmm. the first thing is, give us your postcode and we'll tell you how much your energy is, right? And it's just, just really, really quick, which yeah. is brilliant. And it yeah. gives you the carbon offset at the end as well. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 the thing that caught my eye was, was this statement where you said outrageously good customer service with a friendly human. Yes. Like, cause like we're obsessed with technology and automating and the bots yeah. popping up and, you yeah. know, do you want a conversation with a, with a robot sort of yeah. thing? Um, how important is that positioning to, to the success of the business? So we see our, our CTO, it says that our operations team are the gods who technology serves. Right. So our technology serves our humans, it enables, makes their lives easier. So we have an incredible platform, which means our, our super people are enabled to do their job as much as possible. You know, a platform that means a load of our customers self-serve. If you want to self-serve, that's absolutely fine. Lots of people don't want to engage with their energy company. But actually, if you want to call us, then, you know, we don't have limits on... SLAs on how long someone can spend on the phone, for example, because it's like actually, 
you know, you should be able to spend as long as you want if you've chosen to call us. And actually that agent will have all the technology in place to to be able to support you, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it, right. it's yeah. kind of, you know, humans are fabulous and we should enable their their fabulousness to in, interact with consumers, but then the technology backs it backs it up. That's such the right round. I've always believed that, that as soon as we see technology as replacing humans, we've lost. We, technology should enable us to be more human and 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 free us up to be, have the conversations yeah. on the phone. Because I mean, I, I find this in my in my day job so often is yeah. one phone call gets you so much further than than endless you know automated conversations could ever get you. Well, when you phone us, we don't have. Um, you know, we didn't want to have a system where, you know, you press one for meter readings and two for payments and three for, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you phone us, you'll get, we aim to answer the phone in two minutes maximum. You get through to a human who, I, and our, our people are fully trained in every aspect of the energy account, right? So they're all graduates, you know, they know it, they can sort anything. So we aim for like a 90% first time fix that the person you talk to on the phone will deal with your problem, whether it's give us a meeting or, or whether it's a really complex industry situation where we've mixed up your house with the one next door or something. Uh, and actually what we also do is that you're always, customers are always looked after by the same t- team of like eight to 10 people. So when you join us, you're kind of assigned to a team um, and that those 10 people will always look, look after you. So whenever you phone, you'll be rooted to that group of people. If you email, you'll be rooted to that group of people. So there's no like, you know, other companies, you know, you just feel like someone goes, oh, yes, that'll definitely happen, sir, and hangs up and then there's no notes yeah. because it's the same team under the same team leader. So you can literally phone up and go, can I speak to Ben again? Because I spoke to him last week. And if he's not in, then someone who's next to him is like, oh, Ben's off today, but can I help you? Yeah, five million customers, but you can speak to the same person you spoke to last week. I love that so much because, I mean, like, we've all experienced it, haven't we? Where you kind of go, you go through the bot process, and you end up like, well, they haven't. My question doesn't fit in the list of standard, yeah. like, standard yeah. answers yeah. that come up. Or you go through the menu option and realise that you, you, you know, fifteen minutes into your menu, you haven't got any. You got to the wrong kind of answer, sort of thing. Yeah. It's just insanely frustrating. Yeah. And actually, a human would have diagnosed it in seconds. Yeah. You know, yeah. both those processes. So oh, that's amazing. Um, Let's kind of talk about marketing for a bit. Why an octopus? Like, how did the octopus come about? And why, why the name? So this is actually because so our um, the first backers of Octopus Energy, a business called Octopus Investments, which is a um, financial services company set up by a chap called Simon Rogerson. And he named his business Octopus just because no financial services companies were called such silly things, as I understand it. He was like, actually, you want to stand out. He was like, oh, why not to call it Octopus? And so when they backed my boss, Greg Jackson, I think there were some conversations about different names. And But I think they were like, why not just call it Octopus Energy? Why not, really? And it kind of went from there. And it's such a fabulously visual device that that when I joined it's quite early days and I was like wow bloody pink octopus and I saw that someone had a little toy in the office where we'd created an octopus to go to an event like a one-off I think it was hand sewn by by a lady in Wales and and I was quite obsessed by compare the market and the meerkats they were sending out because I think they became the number one soft toy distributor and I'm like I think there's a big thing in toys like people just love toys you know so we started giving them out we made some more we started giving them out on Twitter as competitions and then it just became a massive thing because everybody Everybody likes a toy and everyone kids who like a toy, you know, and it's just it's just so so simple a device and so kind of iconic. Yeah, that oh, it's brilliant. It works really it's well. It's funny, actually, because there's actually some science to this as well, which I, I've recently discovered. So a colleague of mine, Orlando, wrote this book. And in the book, he actually went to the effort of deconstructing advertising in terms of all the different features and measuring which of the features grab our attention the most. So, you know, would, would um, a character acting or would a you know, soundtrack or does having the words pop up on the screen or does your logo, you know, he literally deconstructed it down to its, you know, tiny little bit. And then he he basically measured which feature in advertising captures our attention the most. He also looked at which feature in advertising generates the biggest emotional response in the audience, right? The number one thing that grabs attention and creates the most emotion is animals, right? (laughs) So there is literally science behind why having an animal as your, you know, fluent device, you know, that you use is... Is it, is is it anthropomorphic animals or like with kind of human type features? Because our octopus has kind of human type features. And actually that works. It's got big eyes and a little mouth, which actually looks like a baby. And we are genetically yeah. programmed to respond to those kind of faces as that's a nice thing to look at. Well, I think you're probably doing the double here. You've got animal <laughs> and baby. Animal right? and <laughs> Which baby. Is like baby animal. You know. You've got um, pink. So, I mean, I, I think you're acing it on um, that. I think the other thing as well is the team, you know, the, the senior team 
at, at Octopus. Like I'm, I'm not a, no, no, didn't really want to be a marketeer, I'm not a career marketeer. I just happen to have built this business and that's what I do. But, you know, I, I, I'm not moving on somewhere else. So it's like actually, you know, you don't have that kind of, be a bit careful now because it's a CMO podcast, but that slightly revolving door. And some businesses are of CMOs who come in and I'm going to do this campaign this year and then everything changes. You know, it's like actually we can be consistent because nobody's trying to better the marketing director who last, left last year. No one's got this year's target. Well, do you know what? That's such a common, it's a common theme actually on the, on the podcast because when I talk to and it's like Meg Farron at KFC or I talk to Dom Dwight at Yorkshire Tea uh, or, or Mark Evans at Direct Line, the, the thing about... All their stories is consistency and longevity and of them and the team. So in all those cases, they've been in their roles or progressed up the organization for at least seven to 10 years. And the belief and the knowledge and the trust and all those things allows them to make some very, take some very big decisions and get back. And it's so, and I just think as an industry, the CMO turnover is like the very moment you actually get to grips with the job yeah. I mean, it takes a year just to kind of figure out what the hell you're doing yeah. build a plan hire the people yeah. and then you're fired six months or in you, my yeah. case you're fired before then but i mean <laughs> like, totally you know. agree totally agree. and it's like and again if you go back to, to you know to, to to brand and what people remember from brands they don't remember that campaign that someone did in 2014 with you know it was particularly clever they remember the simpler things about brands so one of my favorite brands was always virgin and i was like well it's red and it's branson and they kind of challenge industries i kind of had that vague thing yeah. you know and some things didn't work but some things were really good and the service was quite good. There was kind of these vague ideas of what a brand is and that's definitely not this year's campaign or that year's well, I think we're quite director. similar on this one because actually, my, my, going back to my classically trained, yeah. I think the answer to most things is much simpler than people make out. People have like invented this kind of scary science yeah. to make it intimidating so that when you speak in a room, no one will challenge you because you just sound clever. The answer is pretty simple. In fact, I had Richard, Richard Schott and um, he's just written a new book on, on, on the show and he said there's actual behavioural science thing where people feel under pressure to give a cleverer answer to justify their status right so if you're a consultant if you give a simple answer you feel like you've not added value and it's a thing right i I just think the industry is full of that i must sound clever i must come up with a complicated answer but i think it does come down to the color of your brands the personality of the founder you know the basic things i mean i've done um a number of times when i've done advertising development and I've loved one of the routes, but it's been the clever one. And then I've gone and tested it and went, oh, it's the really simple idea that I thought was a bit basic, you know. Yeah, yeah. What's the one everyone got? Because, yeah. like, they're, they're, you know, people have got so many messages thrown at them. And yeah. you need, if you don't understand it, you yeah. know, what's the point? And I think the only thing I haven't mentioned, actually, into all that, that actually the product has to be good. You can't put lipstick yeah. on a pig, right? So this is the key. That This is the reason the octopus is successful. It's not because of you know, any cleverness with sending baby octopuses out to people or all vibrant pink is because it's a bloody good business. The service is better than anywhere else. You know, we are a fairer business. It's like, it just all works brilliantly, brilliantly together. And what marketing does is help build that, that business, not just because we promoted it, because we built it. I look after customer experience and product and everything. But that's the key thing as well, that it doesn't matter how good There's a really good case, is. isn't there, to have products and, ex- and customer experience within the marketing function. That's that's just, quite powerful, isn't it? I don't know how you can spit it out. I mean, I, well, I wanted to, you know, and I've worked at British Gas for a few years, great company, but I couldn't I couldn't bear any more being a marketer that people bought stuff to and went, oh, can you just do some advertising, you know, on this thing? And I'm like, but that's all, it's all broken, you know? I spent a while trying to fix the sales funnel on one of the businesses, but it wasn't really my area. But I'm like, I just, you know... And um, so I went, when I went, went to Hive and I built stuff, love building stuff, building hardware. I'm like, here we go. Here's a good thing. And I didn't do the marketing bit. So when I came to Octopus, I was like, I don't want to do marketing. And he, and Greg said, well, I've got a big, a big space. I don't really want to hire a marketer either because he's marketer, he's XP&G, but I've got a big space in product and customer experience and marketing. And actually it's a startup. We're all a bit fluid. We all go in each other's areas anyway. So it's just kind of started from there. It's, it's well, it comes back to your website actually, because um, it does not look like the website of a 10 10- billion sorry 10 billion dollar company does it 10 million pound company i should say yeah. well the first thing i noticed is, is how simple it is yeah. and how yeah. you've emphasized well you emphasize the awards you get and you also emphasize how easy it is to switch yeah. but it certainly doesn't feel like a 10 you know 10 million dollar com- company usually have corporate statements and big shiny videos and that yeah. kind of thing yeah. um is that an intentional plan to kind of make the experience as easy as possible yeah, it will work it's, it's yeah. a website optimized for acquisition yeah. you know we obsess over it but we don't change it you know, we don't go, oh, I just fancy changing the website if it works. We, you know, we, we just kind of, we, we tweak little things. But yeah, absolutely. There's no value to customers on a big shiny mission statement or, you know, or fancy videos. And also not many people go on, 
people don't really go on websites anyway. You don't go, you know, I mean, if you're signing up, you probably go, people go on the homepage and they'll go on the About Us page, right? And then that's kind of, and then they'll go back to the homepage again. And actually, obviously the website hosts a load of stuff like the online account, which so we'll email someone about something and send them a link to a specific place. You know, it's not somewhere that people go and people don't trot around, people, you know, company websites, just, just for the hell of it, they go to a place. So yeah, it's optimised for the job that people need it to do. Now, I don't know whether this is salience, right? But I've seen your advertising everywhere in the last week. Is it just because you're coming on the podcast that I'm suddenly like tuned into your advertising? Or have you actually got a campaign out there at the moment that is on <laughs> digital outdoor all over the place, is on radio? We do we do have some we do have out of home and, and, yeah. and radio out at the moment. So we we, we pulled back um, over the winter, but it's a it, it's a bit wider now. Um, and we, we have, you know, we always have a low level uh, uh, kind of always on strategy. We also don't change our creative very much. Because it's like, again, going back to that, you know, people like to, oh, it's, this is the new campaign this year and people just don't, you know, forget it. So literally, I mean, our the TV ad uh, that we're not running at the moment, we ran for like three years. It was the same one and we actually did it in-house, shot it in-house. It cost £10,000 to do and we, and we used it for, for years and years and years because people just, we, we say to each other internally that we get bored of advertising much before everyone else does, right? So just because you're like, oh, we should maybe change it. Like no one else does because yeah. no, no one cares. So. Still, yeah, yeah, usually we cut a campaign just at the point the consumer's seen it for the first time. Yeah, yeah. yeah so totally, true. Totally now totally you talk well. a lot about the awards you've won in advertising. Is that a conscious, is it like some social proof to reassure people that, you know, it's a safe switch to make. Is that what's yeah, the rewards? Yeah, particularly in the early uh, early days. So we're the only witch recommended energy supplier for for six years in a row, and and we, you can't apply for that. It just you know we got a phone call kind of six years ago saying we'd won the first one. And we were like, oh, thank you very much. That's very nice. And we didn't realize how big it was. There, you know, they're really big and really well respected. And I think it's useful for people like that kind of social proof to to look at. So we work quite hard on. I mean, awards are, you know. I mean, <laughs> you know some some you enter and some you don't enter and some you influence and some you can't influence but i think the plethora of the ones that we do win you know people do do respond to that and that it is that additional reassurance and we're also proud of what we've achieved as business as well must feel good for employees as well to be associated with a company that's won consistently yes every year yes and we're we're top of glass door as well i think our ceo's got like a 96 approval rating it used to be 100 he's really pissed off about the four percent but you know it's (laughs) like you know but we've got three thousand people but so that's very important as well that actually it's not about customers it's about humans right and actually i'd probably put our people before our customers because if you're enabling great people and make giving them an environment that you know makes them happy then they'll give great service and want to do great things for customers now a slightly different question to end on here because i had um leo raymond who uh, he was the chief strategy officer and ceo of gray london yeah. he and i worked together for a few years and uh, he set up his own uh, kind of green agency called eden labs and i had him on the podcast late last year and he posed this question, which is, uh, every one of my clients, I ask, what's your clean share of market? Because he said, in the future, you'll be judged on your ability to kind of, you know, you know, take share in the clean energy rather than sort of dirty energy, which I thought was a fascinating way to think about it. Because obviously, you know, businesses are trying to grow, aren't they? Yeah. And it's like, well, actually, can you grow in a green way? Uh, yeah. You know, sort of yeah. thing. What would your advice? <laughs> obviously, you're leading that because well, I mean, obviously whole, you're yeah, part whole, of the solution, yeah, right? Yeah. But if you were not in your position, if you're, mm. you know, if, you, if you're me, what advice would you give to other marketers who are thinking about how can I improve, I guess, my share of the green economy or how can I transform my business? I think every decision that you're making, see whether there could be a slightly better way of doing it. I think don't get too het up about it because I think I worry about it's like we must all be sustainable in everything. You know, does it really matter if like I don't know whether our toilet roll at works recycled because it doesn't really you know it, that doesn't really matter because i know that i'm driving so much that is that's kind of slightly relevant but somewhere else like that if that's the only thing you can do is buy recycled toilet roll you know then buy recycled toilet roll and don't worry about the other stuff i think just do what you can do and don't give yourself too much of a hard time push yourself a little bit but you know you, yeah. you don't always have to kind of move, move so I know the thing that surprised me is when i've spe- talked to people that understand ha- all this is i've been really shocked at the things that really make a difference and the things that like straws, you know, perceived to make a massive yes, difference, but yes. more symbolic yeah. versus the things that really do make a difference that, you know, yes. that don't. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's things like, I mean, it's sound a bit like a plug, but I don't mean to make a plug, but actually, you know, use a renewable energy supplier, check yeah. that it is renewable, it should be the same price, you know, whether that's business or domestic supply. We have we have an electric vehicle business where you can lease electric cars and, and there's a lot of there's really good salary sacrifice kind of tax breaks in it. So a lot of big companies are signing up as a perk for employees, take a car, 
it's an EV, you know, and that then drives, you know, the charging infrastructure and local authorities to put more in. So there's all that kind of, you know, so, um, so I think, you know, try and try and challenge where you, where you, where you can, but uh, you know, energy is a good, is a good place to yeah, start. Brilliant. Well, good night to end on. And thank you, Rebecca, for coming on. Right. And Pleasure. Uh, if they want to get hold of you, Octopus Energy. There is, I have a special email address, rds at Octopus Energy. Ah, there you go. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me on the Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Rebecca from Octopus Energy. I certainly did. If you like that and want to find out more, please do subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube, of course, hit the subscribe button. Never miss an episode again. If you'd like to follow me, I'm over at Uncensored CMO on Twitter and at LinkedIn, where you can find me at John Evans. Thanks for joining me and I hope to have you next time. Thanks.